all of a sudden their protein deposition is almost exactly the same after 40 days. So if after 40 days, the drug is like essentially doing nothing, obviously it implies that there's no more muscle being built above and beyond that first. So guys, Derek, moreplacemoreadies.com. Today we're gonna to be talking about do anabolic steroids still build muscle past week six? So this is kind of like a magic number in the, um, you know, like bodybuilding, I don't know, pharmacology research space, I guess. I don't know, whatever we want to call that, where we try to speculate about what the best way to go about building muscle is and how to, you know, not only do it smart from a risk context, but as well as maximize the time you are exposing yourself to dangerous amounts of hormones. So, you know, there's a theory that, uh, you know, like a longer, slower approach is better where you basically, like it takes a long time to accrue a significant amount of muscle. So having a long, you know, drawn out off season where you pack on like one pound of like quality weight every week, or every two weeks even, you know, obviously that number is gonna vary, but just like, you know, a ballpark is like pack on just like a tiny bit of weight, a very slow progressive period of time versus the guys who think you should like hit it hard, take advantage of the increased um, nitrogen retention, protein accretion, um, all of the anabolic processes that are brought on by exogenous anabolics that seem to potentially plateau entirely by like week six, seven-ish. So like I said, some people think that you'd need, you know, like 12, 16, 20 week off seasons to build the max amount of muscle. And it's all, you know, a dose dependent increase and androgen receptors upregulate. They don't downregulate when you use anabolics because all the studies show that they upregulate. And like, this is, there's so many, like, there's not so many theories. There's only really like a couple. It's either that, well, as far as how muscle like slows down, like you've obviously experienced yourself if you've done gear is, you take something, you will make a significant amount of progress, and then it seems to sort of like flatten out and you kind of just like either make no progress or you make like much a lesser amount of progress for relative to the kind of like initial influx of everything. It's a bad way to put it, but I'm not just talking about like temporary weight that floods you like water weight or something like that, which a lot of times people will kind of misconstrue side effects as benefits and then, you know, associate all oh, like I gain more muscle from this compound because of this. And they're not, you know, they're perceiving just like <laughs> bloating or like intramuscular flooding of water retention essentially with like increased, you know, like protein accretion, which is like not the case. Some people also think, and it's not some people, there's evidence to suggest that myostatin increases after a certain amount of time on gear. And at that point, you're basically inhibited from growing anymore because of this thing that essentially tells your body you're gaining too much muscle and you gotta stop. And I've made videos on this before myself. I've talked about how rotating compounds at week eight makes no sense. And coaches who talk about doing this, it just makes no sense. There's no logic behind it. Um, and how, and I still stand behind that, you know, like rotating a compound. It depends if you're using something that, like I've started to learn more about like glucocorticoid receptor antagonism and things like this that, you know, different compounds are have different properties in terms of being like agonists and antagonists and blah, blah, blah of certain other like satellite receptors in the body that isn't just, it's not just about the androgen receptor at the end of the day, although that is like the main thing we are like concerned with for the most part with some compounds, but there's a lot of compounds that have terrible affinity for the AR, but still do a lot of things that don't really make sense considering what they are and their chemical structure, like things that are DHT derivatives that are, you know, like progestogenic in nature or things that have like unmeasurable binding affinity for AR, but somehow build like way more muscle than something that's like binds nearly as strongly as trend. And like, you know, like things that just like don't make sense on paper or are like, we just don't understand or I, I don't understand. So <laughs> always trying to learn. And sort of the thing I want to delve into in this in particular is myostatin as well as the upregulation of androgen receptors. And like I've talked about this myself, do androgen receptors downregulate? You know, there's all the, all the evidence suggests I'm not going to uh, reiterate what I mentioned previously in my other previous videos about how AR upregulates, doesn't downregulate and myostatin goes up at this time. Basically what we see is 
when you use exogenous anabolics, AR upregulates, and the more muscle you gain, the more AR you essentially have, and um, the more you know you can express, um, have gene transcription occur, and blah blah blah. So there's this theory that it's kind of interesting though, because when you really think about it logically, if you use like a stimulant or you use something, what we see is like. In layman's terms, we see a downregulation of certain receptors. With almost any drug, you see downregulation with like chronic abusive, like smashing the receptor. With androgen receptors, though, the claim by a lot of people, and you know, I believe this to be true for a while too, is that it just upregulates. Up and the more gear you use, the more it upregulates to accommodate this increased androgen load. And there's no such thing as downregulation. It's simply just like you need more drug to like produce more of an effect and blah, blah, blah. And muscle building is a slow process. So if you're not making gains, it's just increase the dose or, you know, increase your food or increase this or do that. There's no, there's no like, the homeostatic mechanisms aren't like clearly understood above and beyond just like it's myostatin going up. The thing that's weird though, and this is actually something I noted in my first, when I first was delving into the myostatin research, when I was doing my first myostatin video like over a year ago, you see a spike in myostatin levels after a certain amount of time on anabolics. However, what you see after staying on the same dose of superphysiological anabolics is that those myostatin levels don't stay elevated. They actually go back down to baseline. So in the graded dose response study in um, healthy young men, I'm sure you've seen the study. It's one of like the most notable studies in, uh, you know, super physiological anabolic steroid use. We see that in men treated with graded doses of testosterone, myostatin levels were significantly higher on day 56 than baseline in both young and older men. Changes in myostatin levels were significantly correlated with changes in total and free testosterone in young, in young men. Myostatin levels were not significantly associated with lean body mass in either young or older men. Myostatin has the characteristics of a blah, 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 blah. Okay, so they're going over a assay for assessing myostatin levels essentially here. But the interesting thing that is weird about this is the fact that when you measure myostatin levels after 20 weeks on the same dose of testosterone, like we haven't come off here, we're on the same super physiological amount, it goes back to baseline, even in the super physiological, like the highest dose group. So it basically like spikes up after a couple months to you know, what we would think is counteract you from gaining more muscle because this is the mechanism that's supposed to get, stop you from gaining too much muscle, right? So, you know, by week eight, the uh, the myostatin levels spike up and then that's your like signal that, oh, you can't do shit now because you have too much myostatin. You need to inhibit it if you want to keep gaining progress or you need to increase your dose. And then once you increase your dose, the myostatin is going to go up to, you know, counteract the muscle from that dose and blah, blah, blah. Or you just come off and you reset it and then you have to do it again. But the myostatin levels at week, by the end of the whole study, regardless of the fact that we stayed on the same dose, not we, but the people in the study, um, they go back to baseline. And interestingly enough, it didn't seem to have a bearing on what the outcome was. So I don't know how this go went, okay, I know how this went overlooked because I overlooked it myself when I was trying to be not lazy, but it was like in my video, I basically outlined how there are homeostatic mechanisms in the body we don't understand yet and haven't been clearly elucidated. And that was sort of my very, very brief way of outlining that the myostatin thing doesn't necessarily add up and make a whole lot of sense um, in the grand scheme of things. So there's probably other factors that have to do with what's going on here. The Belgian blue double muscle cattle is another example. So they have a myostatin gene mutation, which, you know, consequently prevents its feedback loop of muscle growth inhibition from working correctly and interferes with fat deposition. And the ultimate eventual result is accelerated lean muscle growth. And the acceleration of muscle growth in Belgian blues is due primarily to physiological changes in the animal's muscle cells from hypertrophy to a hyperplasia mode of growth. So this growth occurs in the fetus and results in a calf being born with two times the number of muscle fibers as a calf without a myostatin gene mutation. So this is interesting to note because it may elucidate certain conclusions about the gene itself that may influence whether or not myostatin inhibitors are really a therapeutic treatment option to begin with because it seems like a large portion of this growth may, at least in the Belgian blues, is mediated before birth even occurs. So in the fetus, these calves are born with 
with twice the number of muscle fibers. And then now that they have those muscle fibers, they can induce hypertrophy in throughout their you know growth phase. That's the result of them getting hypermuscular, not necessarily that throughout their growth phase, they had an inhibition of myostatin. So that's notable. The next thing that should be noted is myostatin elevates in response to androgen. So obviously there's very likely other counter regulatory mechanisms in the body that inhibit excessive muscle growth. And the main factor appears to be myostatin elevation in certain data. So myostatin increases to prevent you from gaining unhealthy amounts of muscle. We already know this. And in the following study, the effects of exogenous testosterone and trend blown on myostatin levels was evaluated. And this study showed that after 29 days of administration of either testosterone or trend blown, myostatin levels were 197% higher in the castrated and testosterone group and 209% higher in the castrated and trend blown group when compared to placebo. So there's obviously a mechanism in place for a reason. It's not like our bodies can just grow linearly forever. Like there's obviously some sort of mechanism in place to keep everything at homeostasis and it's believed that myostatin is potentially the main one so too much of anything is bad and you know trying to put your body into a place that isn't healthy with insane amounts of muscle mass obviously homeostatic mechanisms will try and regulate that so the human body is basically just a big balancing act at the end of the day so if the theory is more androgens equals more myostatin, which equals more muscle growth inhibition. So as I previously outlined, myostatin is a growth inhibitor that elevates in the presence of androgens. And based on the current research, it appears that the higher your dose of exogenous anabolics, the greater muscle growth potential you have. And consequently, the higher your myostatin will elevate in parallel, as well as other counter regulatory mechanisms to inhibit absurd rates of muscle growth. So in a study evaluating the effects of graded doses of testosterone and what they have on myostatin levels in young and older men, myostatin levels were significantly higher on day 56 than baseline in both groups and the myostatin hypothesis definitely isn't airtight and has some holes in the data contradicting its muscle growth inhibiting effects like you know after a certain amount of time myostatin levels falling again even when androgens are elevated and a lot of things that kind of like throw the theory out for some people but at the end of the day the you know results we see in animals as well as potentially in humans is hard to you know ignore and myostatin is well known to negatively regulate muscle mass in mice cattle dogs and humans myostatin is elevated in hiv positive individuals too which i found super interesting so it's detectable in human skeletal muscle and its expression is increased in the muscles of hiv infected men with muscle wasting compared to that in normal men so does that mean that the muscle wasting that occurs with disease is caused in part by myostatin elevation i don't know maybe but you know the relationship between the two is definitely notable at the very least And this is, I actually put this in my article because this is something I found after I did my video. So then I wrote about in the article how some of these studies are contradictory. And I published this like last year or whatever. It was just like, I always do the articles after the videos, the videos that go kind of off the top of my head. I uh, reference what I've seen in the studies and sometimes I'll uh, end up digging a lot deeper during the articles because they're like, in my opinion, like perfected versions of my videos where I kind of just like dig deep, have all the, you know, citations broken down with, clear and concise, you know, subsections, table of contents, all the references cited with hyperlinks for you to go delve into it yourself if you want to, that kind of stuff. And when I was delving into the research further and getting all my citations in order and whatnot, I noticed the thing went back to baseline. Then I was like, oh shit, well, maybe that's not the end of the story and it's probably not it. But, you know, there's all the evidence about AR upregulating. So there's a lot of conflicting things going on. And clearly myostatin isn't the end of the story here. And it's just odd how you know, like every receptor in the body, you if you, you know, take a shit ton of stimulants or you take a shit ton of any drug, you eventually need to use more to yield the same effect because your body adapts to it. And we see that with gear too. You sort of, you know, it's pretty obvious that you plateau eventually and you either increase the dose or you have to get off and kind of like reset yourself. And that's the same way all drugs work essentially. This is why if you take, you know, like 200 milligrams of caffeine, that might be a lot for, you know, one person who's sensitive to caffeine eventually they're going to, you know, adapt to that and tolerate it. And they could work their way up to like several cups of coffee a day and not even feel it. And then eventually they either have to use more to continue feeling it, or they need to cycle off of it and reset their sensitivity. And then, you know, they go have their first cup of coffee again after two months of not having any caffeine and boom, it's like one cup has them flying. So (laughs) with gear, I feel like it's some of the mechanisms, obviously you can't relate it exactly, but that's just an example of, uh, Examples of drugs that have a, you know, an effect on the body where you basically get used to it. So the first study I find interesting is 
The problem with some of these graded dose response studies is they don't have like metrics in the middle at different incremental times. So you have like, it'll typically show baseline body composition and then it'll show like target endpoints or whatever, or it'll have like the final body composition at the end of like several months, but it won't show like four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks, 20 weeks. So we can actually see where like protein accretion essentially just like cut off or if it did at all. And of the studies we have available to us where it shows, you know, where gains essentially stopped. One that we have is a 12 week study of anivar use. So in this study, six week improvements in muscle mass and strength during androgen therapy in older men. So in this study, basically the purpose of it was to assess the early effects of a potent anabolic androgen on muscle mass and strength, lower extremity power and fu functional performance in older men. So they are randomized 32 men, 72 um, years old, approximately, you know, plus minus six, were randomized to receive Anivar, 10 milligrams twice daily, or a placebo in a two to one manner for 12 weeks. So they basically used 20 milligrams of Anivar or nothing for 12 weeks and assessed. The thing that was interesting about this though, is they had body composition and, you know, like strength metrics halfway through the study and at 12 weeks. So total lean body mass increased by 2.7 kilograms after six weeks with Anivar, which was greater than the decline in lean body mass with placebo. Appendicular lean body mass increased by 1.2 kilograms after just six weeks of Anivar, which was greater than the decline in lean body mass with placebo. These changes were greater than 90% of the gains in total and appendicular lean body mass after 12 weeks. So, Listen closely here. These changes were 90% of the gains in total and appendicular lean body mass after 12 weeks. 90% of the gains were in the first six weeks. Total thigh and hamstring muscle volume increased by 111, uh, blah, 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 respectively after 12 weeks. Maximal strength increased for leg press, leg curl, chest press, um, lat pull down with Anavar after six weeks. These increases were different than those with placebo and were 93%, 96%, 74%, and 94% of the respective gains at week 12. There were no improvements in functional measures. Treatment with a potent anabolic androgen may produce significant increases in muscle mass and strength after only six weeks in healthy older men. However, such treatment did not improve leg muscle power or walking speed. So in this study, it was a blatant, you know, the, it stopped working after, it didn't stop working. It's simply the body adapted after six weeks. So exactly what happened there. A lot of people would assert, well, myostatin spiked up like you see in the testosterone study at like, you know, almost the halfway mark in the testosterone study, myostatin levels are like through the roof and that's what's stopping it. But this is a study I found really recently that sort of really interested me. And it was during my um, Trenbolone plus estrogen versus Trenbolone video. So this one, it was the effect of a combined Trenbolone acetate and estradiol implant on fetal lot performance, carcass characteristics, and carcass composition of fetal lot steers. So we've seen some data on humans where they have like metrics in the middle of a cycle and at the end of the cycle showing the majority of actual contractile tissue accrual was done in the first little bit, as opposed to the tail end of it, there was a much lesser amount of gains occurring, or you were simply in a position where you either need to increase the dose or increase your food or increase something in order to stimulate above and beyond growth. Because obviously you can only do the same thing for so long and expect changes. Like you can't just you know lift the same weight for months on end and expect to grow continually. You can't eat the same amount of food and continue to gain weight continually. You can't use the same drugs for years on end and expect to yield the same effects once your body gets used to it if you're continuously chronically exposing yourself to the same dose. So something needs to change. And in this study in particular, what I found the most interesting is after 40 days, so there, this, the whole point of the study was to see if, you know, essentially if there was different metrics, but the main one that I was extrapolating out that was really interesting to me and applicable to us is, you know, Trenbolone and estrogen versus Trenbolone, which one builds more muscle? Muscle. They found that the Trenbolone plus estrogen builds more muscle and then basically outlines the importance of estrogen in downstream cascades that help with muscle accrual, um, as well as, you know, like health things like cardio protection, neuro protection, et cetera. So in this study though, after 40 days, rates of carcass protein deposition were similar between implanted and non-implanted steers. This implies that differences in carcass protein mass at the end of the feeding period after implantation with trenbolone acetate and estradiol 
may be largely due to significant increases during the, four, the first 40 days after implantation. So this implies that if all of a sudden after, okay, protein deposition between a, a steer that isn't, doesn't even have trend in its system versus a, a steer that has trend and estrogen, like we're talking about literally a natty steer <laughs> versus a sauce to the gills one, all of a sudden their protein deposition is almost exactly the same after 40 days. So we have in this, the 40 day mark where um, protein deposition basically halted essentially, despite the fact that you're on trend and estrogen versus the steer that's on nothing. If you divide 40 by seven, that's five, that's almost six weeks, exactly. So it's kind of interesting how in the Anivar study, in this study, um, obviously on steer, so it's not directly applicable, but you know, bodily processes are pretty similar in certain contexts, obviously, you know, take that with a grain of salt, but this is something we can extrapolate that's really interesting. So 40 days, gains just halt in the steers on trend and estrogen. Now, like I said, myostatin levels return to baseline in the middle of a cycle. Now, before I delve into AR expression itself, kind of staying on the estrogen thing, this is another thing that I should have noted in my trend balloon plus estrogen video that I feel like is worth sliding in here as far as actual expression of AR before we talk about how it may or may not downregulate, quote unquote. In this study, from estrogen to androgen receptor, a new pathway for sex hormones and prostate, it evaluates estrogen's effect on androgen receptors. And what they actually found is that estradiol itself, but not other estrogens, activates AR to a certain, in a certain way. Let me explain. So while all three coactivators, ARA70, steroid receptor coactivator one, and RAC3, ACTR can enhance androgen receptor AR transcriptional activity at one nanomolar dihydrotestosterone, we here demonstrate that only ARA70 can induce AR transcriptional activity greater 30 fold in the presence of 10 nanomolar 17 beta estradiol E2, but not diethyl stilbestrol. The significance of this new, newly described E2 induced AR transcriptional activity in DU145 human prostate cancer cells was further strengthened by finding patients with Reifenstein partial androgen insensitive syndrome that fail in the estradiol androgen receptor ARA70 pathway. Together, our data suggests for the first time, testosterone dihydrotestosterone may not be the only ligands for the AR. Estradiol represents another important natural ligand for androgen receptor that may play an essential role for the AR function and the development of the male reproductive system. So that's something that you know, lend to the, not only to the, uh, more so that there's more factors than just like the anabolic agent itself binding to AR that determines how the AR transcribes its effects and how effective, I guess it is at doing what it's, you know, what you're intending to do during your hormone use, essentially, because E2 plays a very critical role that's often overlooked. And a lot of it is in downstream cascades for muscle growth. And, you know, even as upstream as like literally at the AR itself, which is often not talked about at all. Now getting into the studies itself, I'm going to uh, defer to Tan Clark on this because he actually compiled this and you know some of his uh, findings sort of you know reinforce the six week on you know blast phase hypothesis whereby you know AR expression essentially down regulates after six weeks. So I definitely want to put give him credit at this part because it's. It's a lot of what kind of like influenced my opening my mind to accept this potential hypothesis because anecdotally we see bodybuilders all the time who are always like, you know, 12 week to 16 week off season. That's what you need to do. And honestly, anecdotally, it seems like a lot of what they say, you know, may play out in practical application. But some of the data suggests that you may just be inhibiting catabolic processes past this initial spike in AR expression and protein deposition and this sort of some of the data reinforces this and it seems like personally in some of my blast phases in the past it seemed like things really slow down past like the six seven week mark and then after that it was kind of just like unnecessarily exposing yourself to hormone in some cases though that's, a, that's not the case with everyone and a lot of those blast phases too were when i didn't really know what i was doing and you know perceiving side effects as potential benefits as well but with that being said you know, like I said, there's a, there's data to lend to the opinion that the six week thing actually may play out. You have the Anivar study, you have the um, Steer study, you have some of these studies, which I'm going to delve into now. And the myostatin thing, like I said, it just doesn't seem to play out in practical application. Like the 
amount of myostatin just like it doesn't stay elevated chronically throughout the whole thing like if you just wait long enough it's going to go back down so but it's not like gains when the myostatin comes back down it's not like gains suddenly pick up at like the you know like the 14 week mark or something and just like all of a sudden things start flying again like you're just as plateaued as you were at like you know day 50 60 when you had like your first plateau so i don't know the myostatin thing doesn't seem to add up um, it may be a factor. I believe it certainly plays a role to some extent. I just don't think it's the whole story. And I think, you know, I'm sure a lot of people probably who even know what I'm talking about probably agree that it's not the only factor to take into account. So in this study here, um, I'm going to read it in order because Tan compiled this and there's not really a point of me not deferring to him on this part. So he has a study here that actually tested the androgen receptor expression from month one to month six. And as the study shows, androgen receptor expression was over double during the first month of testosterone use and basically returned to baseline come month six. So testosterone in anti administration significantly increased skeletal muscle AR protein expression at one month, but AR returned to baseline levels at six months. Figure two shows a representative auto radiogram of a Western blot for skeletal muscle AR from a subject receiving testosterone and a graph of the densitometry data from the treatment group. There was no correlation between the serum testosterone concentration at one month and the change of AR expression from baseline to one month for individuals. IGF-1 protein expression, skeletal muscle increased at one month and remained elevated at six months. AR and IGF-1 protein expression did not change in the placebo group. So you can see here, spikes up with testosterone and then it goes way back down to almost baseline and this is obviously a very uh recognizable study because this is something we have already referenced many times so i'm sure this looks familiar to you if you're wondering why it seems so similar um another study so in this one the studies were performed at the general clinical research center at university of texas medical branch subjects received stable isotope infusions to determine skeletal muscle protein metabolism at baseline and after six months of treatment, exogenous amino acids increased protein synthesis in both placebo and testosterone groups, but to a lesser degree after six months of testosterone treatment. These results indicate that prolonged testosterone administration increases net protein balance in the fasted state, but no additive effect is demonstrated when combined with amino acid feedings taken, however, taken together, however, these diverse stimulatory effects can increase lean body mass and strength over time. So the thing that's interesting about it is it doesn't seem to come down to like upregulation is often seen in these studies and this is stuff I've made videos about but I don't know if that's the whole story because it seems like the expression of the receptor itself seems to not upregulate with time it seems to have a similar effect to other drugs where it you know responds by essentially returning you to homeostasis after a certain amount of time and one thing too with the whole myostatin thing is one thing you'll note is certain myostatin inhibitors like people experiment all the time with things like yk11 creatine's even a potent is a decent myostatin inhibitor apparently there's certain myostatin inhibitors that people have tried f injecting follostatin and stuff and it's like in real life though nobody's really exploded by experimenting with myostatin inhibitors or anything and it seems more like the benefits from them can be realized more so in individuals who are born with genetic mutations that at birth essentially resulted in them having more muscle cells themselves than the next guy so it's not necessarily the amount of myostatin going up during the cycle and then you know that inhibiting your progress it seems like when you're actually born and your muscle fiber composition is determined the lack of myostatin is seems to be what produces these genetic freaks so if you have a genetic mutation that prevents you from you know, having a regulating mechanism on how many literal like myonuclei you have at birth, that is like, you have a cap on like how much hypertrophy you can have to some extent. Obviously there's certain like hyperplasia and things that you can sort of like, you know, fudge with your genetics and kind of push the envelope. But I mean, like at birth, you have a certain amount of like cells that you produce. And a lot of that seems to be based on the myostatin levels in your body. And this is why the cattle that, you know, like the, you know, like the Belgian blues or whatever that you see the insane, you know, like muscle development, the whole like myostatin thing, you see all like these uh, myostatin deficient Belgian blues. That's like the main thing that is shown to exemplify this whole myostatin theory. Their absurd amounts of muscle growth seem to be, the effect seems to be realized in birth that leads to this growth rather than the fact that they have a defective gene during you know like adulthood essentially that is preventing them from stopping to gain muscle like it, by that i basically mean they found that when they're born the lack of myostatin is essentially what results in them having 
a significantly increased density of myonuclei and AR content relative to the other animals that don't have the myostatin deficiency. So it's not, it's not that the mechanism of the myostatin going up or down is determining if you grow or not. It seems like in the womb, the myostatin or relative lack thereof is what determines what your potential is going to be in a muscle growth context because you're going to be born with a certain amount of cells and a certain capacity for hypertrophy in those cells based on your genetic factors that it may be determined by a myostatin in the womb. So that is sort of what I've seen from the myostatin component. So I don't know necessarily that inhibiting it in an adult who's fully grown already is going to have any difference at the end of the day. That leads us to the conclusion of what do you do when you plateau? Well, it's like either just like other drugs, you either increase the dose or you increase your some other stimulus, food, whatever. But in addition to that, there are certain things that influence the AR itself and its expression. And there are you know some things that are becoming more popular as of late that kind of go overlooked that actually have a direct effect on AR content in the muscle. One of those things is L-carnitine. Um, this is something I've been delving into recent, recently myself is the research surrounding exogenous L-carnitine administration, both through um, in, intramuscular injection as well as through uh, oral use and kind of assessing the differences, the pharmacokinetics, the relative lack of bioavailability relative to the injections, um, the influence it has on actual AR content and sort of the ability to get more out of the gear, um, stuff like that. Okay, one thing I just wanted to interject and say um, before we continue the video that I, I realized after I finished recording is a lot of people have been asking me about where to get injectable L-carnitine and you know the stuff I've been experimenting with myself, where do I get it? You know, injectable L-carnitine is something that I've been interested in for a while, but I always uh, avoided simply due to the volume of administration as well as the frequency was a huge turnoff. Basically, the majority of the product on the market is 200 milligrams per milliliter, meaning you need to administer like two to three milliliters per shot. And that means you need to be doing it and you have to be doing it really frequently, like almost every single day. So you'd be doing like two to three milliliter shots at minimum every other day and ideally more than that, which is just something I wasn't willing to do, especially because I use insulin pens, which, you know, the cap on that is one milliliter. And frankly, you probably shouldn't even be doing more than half a milliliter shallow I am. Uh, but anyways, something that has come to the surface and kind of made L-carnitine a viable practice for me to try in my own, you know, TRT protocol is... Um, the fact that my clinic has access to it through a compounding pharmacy at 500 milligrams per milliliter. So the stuff is not pain-free, first of all, obviously at 500 milligrams per milliliter. However, it's something that I could administer with a slim pin and get a good enough dose still. And that's the only reason I use it now, to be honest. I can use it with a slim pin and um, it makes it, the ease of administration is something that I can actually tolerate now. So I actually am willing to experiment with it. And then the oral format is something that I might experiment with down the line too through Gorilla Mine. I'm probably going to come out with an L-carnitine product just to use on off days or something because I don't want to inject every single day, but it's at least tolerable enough that I can use it with a slim pin at, you know, one milliliter is uh, 500 milligrams, which is, you know, you would otherwise be pinning two and a half milliliters to get that much from another brand. So basically, if you want to inquire about uh, L-carnitine from our clinic, I just want to show you guys how to go about doing that. So evolve the link is in my video description obviously there's you know the $50 coupon code is for TRT like a full regimen so it's not like you can just <laughs> you know like come here and like get a fucking vial for free but if it's uh something you're interested in you can still come get it through the clinic you just you know you obviously have to pay the full price but um yeah a lot of people don't even know they have uh they could you know this could be an option for them so if you're interested this is the most you know efficacious version of L-carnitine that could exist. The 500 milligram per milliliter concentration, I haven't seen higher than that. It's relatively tolerable pain-wise, and it's uh, something that can fit in an insulin pin. So it's not something that, uh, you know, most people will care about pinning more frequently rather than harpoons every day, which no one likes doing with two to three milliliters. So basically, if you want to get anything through our clinic, we have an available medications page, which you can click here. Okay, once you get to the available medications page, all you need to do is filter by carnitine and then it should load a 
drop down menu here or you can just click search but it'll drop down all of the uh carnitine medications that we have so here we have l-carnitine injectable 500 milligrams per milliliter in a 30 milliliter vial so you click that and it loads the respective uh, product page and then from here you have to understand though that this isn't like a normal checkout menu because it's not like an e-commerce site this is a hormone replacement therapy clinic so some of these these medications you need to qualify for so you basically need to add it to your wish list and this checkout process is going to become more streamlined and user friendly in the future this is kind of just a bare bones approach we have right now but in the future this will be a lot more user friendly and have a nicer interface but basically once you click add to wish list you are going to be reaching a login page where if you're an existing client you can then log in and add it to your wish list and then go through the checkout process if you've never uh made an account before you're not a current client of ours um basically you can just scroll down and click create account and then from there you can make your account make your uh register your username your name very basic information and then once you've created your account and you've confirmed username first name last name email address password you can go back to the l carnitine page and add it to your wish list and then check out from there and then basically you go through a quick telemedicine call and then if qualified prescribed it and then you would then get access to it at this uh, concentration and anything else that you know we offer through our clinic you would also have access to in the available medication section that you could at least add to your wish list just so you have a laundry list of everything you feel you could benefit from and from there you can talk to our patient care coordinators and see if it's something that uh you know you would benefit from adding to your current protocol and then from there you can talk to our doctor over telemedicine skype facetime zoom whatever's conven convenient for you and get um the actual prescription done but it's honestly pretty simple and um, it's all done from the comfort of your own home. So if you wanna get this uh, L-carnitine, I figured I'd add that in for you because previous to uh, me working with Evolve, I never had access to something like this. I was always, you know, buying, uh, you know, like 200 milligram per milliliter Synthetech or, you know, whatever the other brands were. And I ended up just not using it because it wasn't user-friendly enough for me to be pinning three milliliters a day. So I just stopped using it, to be honest, and I never really gave it a full shot. But this is something I feel can significantly enhance a TRT protocol or a blast phase, in my opinion. So if that's of any interest to you, um, worth checking out, link in the description below. So, you know, it seems like the genetic ceiling is something I don't know if it can be circumvented simply by, you know, lowering myostatin because it seems like in practical application, when you actually measure it, it's not like your potential suddenly goes through the roof when the myostatin comes back to baseline versus when it was, you know, spiked up in the middle of the cycle. It seems like, you know, your plateauing is essentially the same and it seems more like the AR expression. I don't know if downregulate is the right word, but it seems like AR expression is inhibited in some capacity as a homeostatic you know regulating mechanism to react to the exogenous super physiological dose of anabolics being used in addition to that there's sort of a cap on what how much ar you have and how much expression they can do and the actual content of the muscle itself of how many androgen receptors you have and that can be influenced by certain things but at the end of the day i feel like a lot of this is predetermined in at you know when you're being born and when you're growing in as a fetus um but um yeah so like is short cycles the way to go or long cycles honestly it seems like no one really knows you know anecdotally there's a lot of bodybuilders who you know really drive home the longer you know lower slower approach which seems to make sense you know it seems like theologically you would assume it takes a long time to build muscle it's not something that you can just do like that you can't you can't build 10 pounds of muscle in two weeks I can't imagine trying to pack on, you know, tons of muscle in six weeks either. It seems like a very short period of time. However, I wish there was more data on this and I wish some of like the graded dose response studies or the just like super physiological dose response studies with, you know, like Nandrolone at 300 milligrams or Primabolone at 1200 milligrams or the 600 milligram study. I wish there was more like elaborate data and insightful data that shows like right where like protein deposition sort of like cut off for each group, because some of the studies like the Anivar study or the cattle study that I brought up recently, those are very interesting and lead me to sort of, you know, sway my mind in the opposite direction that seems like shorter bursts may be more um, 
efficient as opposed to kind of just like getting the muscle growth component for the first six weeks and then you're essentially just like inhibiting catabolic processes for the next six weeks thereafter during a 12-week cycle and you're kind of just like spinning your wheel stressing your body for no reason when you could be coming off you know like resetting sensitivity whatever happens during that and then going back or theoretically there are certain things that may be able to mimic that like off phase without even having to come off that i'm sort of delving into now that is really interesting to me things that mimic autophagy because something that is often overlooked by bodybuilders who are non-stop trying to redline mTOR and stay anabolic 24 7 and taking their you know like slamming a giant protein shake before bed because god forbid you you know actually have some like cellular cleanup while you're sleeping, <laughs> we gotta be anabolic 24 seven, not having a state of autophagy ever and letting your body like fix um, senescent cells and like clean up the body essentially, I feel like is preventing your body from resetting to get back into ability where it can then push the anabolic component again. And you know, potentially intertwining phases of fasting, intertwining certain peptides that seem to act as analogs that may mimic mechanisms that are activated during lung fasts it's certain things that just like are very new and very foreign to me but i'm starting to delve into now and really you know i'm sort of just going on a, this is a long video i just realized wow but just like some of the stuff that is uh interesting to me that some of you guys that are nerds may uh find interesting too that i'm delving into um in particular one thing that there's very few people i defer to on like things that I have no idea of like brand new concepts and there are some very knowledgeable individuals I've talked to about peptides that may be able to mimic autophagy and that's something I'm delving into right now as well. Um, upregulate decorin expression as well as act as decorin or act as decorin analogs and may be able to prevent this plateau that we see in the clinical data at like, you know, around the week six mark or, you know, maybe certain things you can do just from like, a reset context that basically expedite and make the most use of every minute of time you have because you have a limited time to produce you know substantial outcomes in this uh you know whatever you're trying to do as far as a muscle growth context and the most efficient way to go about that with the least bodily stress is ultimately what we're all trying to do and is ultimately what i'm researching to figure out even if it's not directly applicable to me because i haven't I haven't blasted for years myself, but it's very, very interesting to me or else I wouldn't make topics about this and I wouldn't research it. So um, anything new I find out, I'm going to bring, uh, you know, bring to light and hopefully uh, bring about new theories that may, uh, you know, be groundbreaking and help us avoid unnecessarily, unnecessarily stressing our bodies or spinning our wheels unnecessarily. So take from that what you will. Thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe, check out my blog, moreplatesmoredates.com. Follow me on Instagram at moreplates under show more dates. Actually follow me there. I'm trying to, you know, grow all the platforms in unison. Um, and it's nice to be diversified on them, especially, you know, Facebook, the uh, reach sucks there. If you can like there, that'd be cool. Um, Snapchat, BitChute, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you don't want to burn through your data, like if you listen to this YouTube video in the car with uh, your data on, you probably burned through like several gigabytes of data and I apologize for that. So I recommend you subscribe to the podcast because you can listen on audio rather than have the video component going and burning through your battery and your data. If you're somewhere with poor Wi-Fi or whatever, you can like download the audios or whatever. And it's cool for that. Drop a five-star rating, helps the algorithm there if you don't mind. Um, if you want to support the channel, check out my TRT clinic, link in description below. If you're seeking TRT, hormone optimization, any capacity, I encourage you to reach out to them. They're very well qualified to take a look at your labs and assess any imbalances or deficiencies you may have and then um the our doctors will be able to talk to you over skype facetime zoom whatever's convenient for you for you from the comfort of your own home and prescribe whatever medications may be warranted there's a lot of different options and i recommend you reach out to them if you are interested in optimization in any capacity and you can save 50 dollars off your first uh, treatment with the coupon code mpmd50 um, if you want to support the nootropic and pre-workout formulas i develop uh, Gorilla Mind Nootropics. They are my turnkey formulas for productivity, mental clarity, information retention, basically anything associated with getting a lot of high quality work done in as short of a period of time or just you know producing more hours of high quality work in the same time frame. They're very good for that and it's you know great for university students, great for anybody uh, you know trying to be an entrepreneur, editing, um, you know pr cramming for exams. Um, business presentations, whatever it is that may 
you know, require a mental edge. I feel like they really excel in that and help really push the envelope in terms of getting out more productive hours in the day. And then on top of that, my pre-workout formula, self-explanatory, what those are, Gorilla Mode is the stimulant-based formula and Gorilla Mode Nitric is the stimulant-free formula. And they are both top-notch formulas in this industry, in my opinion, and that is reflected if you just look at the supplement facts breakdown of each and compare it to whatever you're using right now. I believe it's fairly transparent why they're top notch. And you know, I feel like they, the quality speaks for themselves. And as far as anything else I'm associated with, video description below. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.